middle of the briefing. We heard from said colleague at the end of the briefing. Uh, and speaking of Matt, uh, he at one point interjected to offer his own thoughts about how I should run the briefing room. So as I said, not much has changed over the past couple of years. Uh, in all seriousness, no, though there is uh, so much else that has remained constant. Uh, every day since then, I've walked into the briefing room with a team by my side. Uh, and the team you see here today, Vedant, Nathan, Jen, Julia, uh, is just a sliver of the larger enterprise, uh, without which I could not do my job. Uh, the podium may be made for one person, uh, but the briefing requires the support and teamwork of so many more. From my colleagues uh, across the bureaus who brief me every day to come out and to field your questions to the members of the press team uh, who oversee that process, to our video team and technical experts across the building, uh, to those who have the owner's chore of transcribing and later disseminating every single word that's uttered in this room. Uh, I said during my first briefing that I was proud to call the public servants across the State Department colleagues. That was more than 200 briefings ago. Uh, and now that I've reached the last in-person briefing, I should say that I'm both proud and immensely grateful to call them colleagues. Uh, as I told my colleagues last week, any success I've had in this job is a product of that very partnership. All of my failures, on the other hand, are attributable to me and to Matt Lee. <laughs> and speaking of those failures, I've been able to do this job, uh, taking the tough questions on difficult, complex issues uh, because I've always known that my colleagues at all levels will have my back, even and especially uh, when I may have missed the mark. I told this story when Secretary Blinken surprised all of us, uh, me most of all, here last week. Uh, but on his first day in office, in his first meeting, the first guidance out of his mouth was to convey that we should be operating on our toes, not on our heels, and telling the story uh, of America's role in the world. And he hastened to add that when you're operating on your toes, there are times when you'll lean too far forward and perhaps fall flat on your face. I can relate. But just as he said he would, uh, the secretary and his team, uh, along with Deputy Secretary Sherman and all of my seventh floor colleagues, have had my back each time that's been the case. I'm immensely grateful to them for this opportunity, but also for the trust, the confidence, uh, the grace that they've demonstrated uh, to me and to all of our colleagues who have done our best to lean forward uh, every single day. There's a reason I'm not going far after leaving this job. I deeply admire this institution. I deeply admire the people who make it tick. Uh, there's no better mission. There's no finer set uh, of colleagues. Uh, I truly mean that, and I'm truly grateful uh, to all of them. Finally, that brings me to all of you. Uh, I said this to uh, several of you last week in a, in a very different setting, uh, but I'm so appreciative of uh, the relationships that we've developed. Uh, there's always going to be, of course, an inherent tension between the person in my job and those of you in your jobs. Uh, if there weren't, one of us wouldn't be doing our job. Through it all, though, uh, we've never doubted each other's intentions or uh, our integrity, and we've recogni recognized that we have ultimately the same objective, providing audiences around the world with accurate and timely information. There's also something very special uh, about the State Department press corps. You care about these issues. You all know uh, about these issue issues. Some of you know far too much about these issues. Uh, but in the end, I wouldn't want it any other way. Uh, your questions are good ones, and you in turn, uh, you and in turn the American people uh, deserve answers to all of them. It's all part of making real the idea of an informed citizenry, which is the bedrock of any democracy, including, of course, our own. Uh, everyone who has sat in this room is committed to that, I and mean, one of our colleagues nearly paid for it with his life when his car came under attack from Russian forces in Ukraine last year. I'm confident my successor will have the opportunity to welcome Ben Hall back to the briefing room, a moment we'll all relish, no matter where we are. Let me conclude with this. Uh, as I was preparing to take on this job in, in late 2020, a predecessor of mine told me it'd be, it would be the best job I would ever have. Uh, to be sure, there were days when I doubted her. Uh, there were days when I outright cursed her. Uh, but the longer arc and perspective of the past two years has left me convinced uh, that she was right. She was right. I'm grateful to everyone for this opportunity, to all of you in this room, to everyone 
uh, in this building. I'm very deeply appreciative. Thank you. Matt. Okay. Uh, for that, and, and, and thank you to you. Who was that predecessor, by the way? <laughs> I will leave the innocence <laughs> nameless. Well, we know. Yeah. And we know that it's a woman, right? So anyway, um, let me just make a, a couple things on, on timing here. It, it did not escape my notice that um, your departure uh, coincides exactly with the start of the NCAA basketball tournament. And uh, our, uh, yeah, our, now that you're going to be going, yes, and our team uh, is our like beloved uh, Hoyas yeah, are yeah, uh, yeah, yes, nowhere, not yes, even in the NIT. Yes, I don't yeah, think they're. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, I hope you enjoy watching the next couple of weeks on your on your free time. Thank and you. then, uh, secondly, the other thing on timing is that uh, it won't. Uh, it, as everyone knows, the Academy Awards were last night, and uh, I'm pretty confident that if there were a category for uh, for best State Department spokesman. Um, for 2022, uh, <laughs> you would have been a, you would have been a shoe in, or at least or at least a relatively high. Contender. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> but anyway, um, listen, we all, on behalf of everyone in here, I, we appreciate your returning to the podium daily, and 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 your willingness to engage. Uh, you make questions that are irritating or uncomfortable for you, uh, at length. And, um, and, and, and even though your responses may be uh, infuriating to us. So um, anyway, thank you. I and that. Um, good luck uh, in, your next, uh, in your next assignment. Thank you. um, as the secretary said on Thursday when he was here, one of his, uh, well, one thing that he noticed was our sparring on the JCPOA. So I figured I'd start with Iran. Excellent. Not first the JCPOA. But uh, you guys had some pretty harsh, not just you, but the NSC did as well, had some pretty harsh um, reaction to uh, the Iranian foreign minister's comments uh, yesterday that there was a, at least an interim or an initial deal in place to, uh, for a prisoner swap. You, you um, called it a cruel lie. Um, I'm wondering if you can expand on that at all. Why, why is he just making this up out of thin air? Uh, so, Matt, thanks for that. First of all, it was a particularly harsh response, but de deservedly so. Uh, we often deal with the lies that emanate from senior regime officials in Tehran. That's, that's nothing new. But uh, we did call this one especially cruel because their are lives, families, loved ones that hang in the balance. Uh, this is about the fate of three Americans who have been wrongfully detained going on years now. And the fact that the foreign minister would state something that uh, was as untrue as this uh, is just a, a sad reflection uh, on the way uh, the Iranian regime has engaged in this practice, a practice that should have been relegated to the dustbin of history. Uh, many years ago, a practice that should not be uh, alive and well in the 21st century. Uh, what I can tell you is that we are working relentlessly to secure the release of uh, these three Americans. Uh, we have made this, uh, we made this an early priority of this administration. We conveyed in no uncertain terms uh, to the Iranians that this would be a priority of ours. Uh, we were going to do everything uh, we uh, possibly could to secure the release. Uh, the fact that these three Americans still languish behind bars, wrongfully uh, detained, uh, is unfortunately uh, a reflection of the fact that the Iranians have so far uh, not been willing to budge. But we are going to keep at it. It is not helpful for our efforts to uh, secure the release of uh, these Americans for us to detail exactly uh, and precisely what we're doing. but. It is something that we're working on uh, every every single day. Okay. Well, the, the idea that this uh, this money that is being held or is frozen right now in South Korea is, is part of the deal. Can you can you rule that out? Can you say that that's not uh, part of a potential agreement? I just can't speak about our efforts to secure these, the release of these Americans. It's, it is not helpful to their right. And then my last one is then if, as you say, the Iranians are that untrustworthy. 
and they lie all the time, as what you just said. Why on earth would you ever trust them to uphold a nuclear deal? Because, Matt, uh, the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, and this goes back to the 2014, 20, 2015 period now. We're not talking about this in, we, we're, we're, we're not talking about this in the current context, but the JCPOA was not built on trust. Uh, if it was an agreement that was built on trust, it wouldn't have been worth the paper it was written on. Uh, the JCPOA was built on verification. It was built on monitoring. It was the most rigorous and stringent verification and monitoring protocol that was ever peacefully negotiated. And through the verification monitoring protocols, uh, the international weapons inspectors, the U.S. intelligence community, uh, this building over the course of successive administrations uh, were able to determine uh, that Iran was, in fact, abiding by the terms of the JCPOA. That was the case until mid-2018 uh, when the last administration uh, decided to uh, abandon the Iran deal, uh, and Iran has since uh, developed its nuclear program in ways that are entirely inconsistent with the JCPOA, but more concerning to us in ways that uh, are dangerous, in ways that uh, are a threat to uh, peace and stability, potentially, uh, in the region and beyond. So you still believe that, that, that despite all the lies, everything that they're saying that uh, you say is untrue and uh, uh, duplicitous, <laughs> that a return to the JCPOA, if it were possible, is the way to go. We're not. Is the, way, is the way to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon, despite a, all of your misgivings. A, a return to the JCPOA hasn't been on the agenda for months now, Matt. Well, uh, and 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 it and, it, was, and you and just it, said that they have repeatedly and lied it, over and it and, and it hasn't and it hasn't been on the agenda uh, for one primary reason. And that's because when it was on the agenda, there were concrete opportunities that the United States and our uh, partners in the P5 plus one uh, had really at our fingertips to go back in uh, to the JCPOA. We thought we were on the precipice of it, only for the Iranians to once again prove that their word was unreliable uh, and to pull back what they had agreed to. Uh, so that's not on the agenda. What is always going to be on our agenda as a first resort is diplomacy. We continue to believe that diplomacy is the only um, permanent, durable, verifiable uh, means by which to address Iran's nuclear program. We're not uh, giving up our, our ambitions and our hope on that, uh, even as we're preparing for all potential contingencies. Andrea. Uh, I want to just follow up on uh, a related issue regarding China and Iran and the Saudis. But first, I just want to say as a matter of personal uh, comment that when I first came here as a very inexperienced correspondent, uh, Tom Donilon was the spokesman, and then Richard Boucher, and then Nick Burns, and a whole series of very, you know, credible people. Uh, even more recently, Kirby and Saki, of course. Um, but uh, what you have done after an interregnum was to restore the credibility of the podium, the frequency of the briefings, uh, the knowledge of the spokesperson in terms of policy, which made all the difference, and the willingness to grant access on the plane, on travel, as well as in this room and outside of this room. So we're just very grateful, and I think it's, it extends to the Foreign Press Corps, all many of our colleagues who attend your other briefings, and just the importance that you, from the top on down, but that you carried out uh, the 24-7 access, and we all know what that means. So thank, thank you, very you. Much. Appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask you about China's involvement in the Middle East mm -hmm. and what that means does this, in fact, sideline the United States to have you know, China mediating between Iran and the Saudis? And also the New York Times and Wall Street Journal reporting from Friday uh, that the Saudis are pressuring the U.S. in order to grant Israel diplomatic recognition, um, pressuring for some major concessions from the United States, if you could take both of those. Sure. So um, you're asking in the first instance about the PRC's role because of the announcement between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, in recent days of the steps that those countries have pledged to take. First, uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, this has been a question that I've been asked over the past couple years from this podium. And each and every time, starting in 2021 and 2022, 
that I was asked this question, I made a very simple point. Uh, we support dialogue. We support direct diplomacy. We support anything that would serve to de-escalate tensions in the region uh, and potentially uh, help to prevent conflict. Uh, if this is uh, the end result uh, of what was announced in recent days, that would be a very good thing. Um, this is something that has, this is a process that has unfolded over the course of some two years now. Um, we have, as I said before, encouraged it. We have supported it. Uh, the substance of the joint statement that was issued late last week um, is quite similar to what has been discussed during previous rounds. This is a process that has gone through Oman. It has gone through Iraq, Iraq uh, and we have been there supporting it uh, in every, at every step of the way. Uh, we've been doing that uh, because, again, anything that would serve to de-escalate uh, tensions and to prevent conflict is in our interest. It's in the interest of the region. Uh, any efforts that would help to end the war in Yemen uh, also manifestly in our interests, of course, in the interests uh, of the countries in the region as well. Uh, we believe it's long overdue that Iran cease activities aimed at destabilizing its neighbors. Uh, should Iran, as an outcome of this agreement, again, uh, change its longstanding, beha longstanding behavior and actually take steps to respect the sovereignty and non-interference uh, in the internal affairs of its neighbors, uh, that would be beneficial to the region that would very much be in our interest. When it comes to our role in the region, Andrea, and, and let me um, address your, your question, this was not about the PRC. Uh, this was about uh, what Iran and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia committed to. Uh, when it comes to our role in the region and, and whether, uh, as, I've, as I've read, um, our role may be being supplanted, um, some allege, I, I have a difficult time wrapping my head around how our role could be supplanted when no country on earth uh, has done more to help uh, build a more stable, uh, a more integrated region. Um, this goes back to the first days of this administration. You, I think uh, one of the big, uh, one of the first personnel announcements we made uh, was the appointment of a special envoy for Yemen. We were determined uh, in the earliest hours of this administration to do everything we could uh, to bring uh, an end to the violence uh, in Yemen, to save lives, to uh, inject humanitarian assistance. Um, that's precisely what we've helped to do uh, over the course uh, of these past uh, two years. We've supported our Gulf partners as they've enhanced their defensive capabilities. We've done that in very uh, real and tangible ways. Uh, these same partners that uh, have been subject to outrageous attacks, including cross-border attacks from uh, Yemen and uh, from elsewhere as well. Uh, our engagement with the Gulf has led to um, more opportunities for people throughout the re region. Uh, Omani airspace, Saudi airspace, other tangible steps, the Negev process that the United States has been deeply invested in, bringing together uh, foreign ministers and uh, senior leaders from countries uh, throughout the region with Israel as part of our staunch efforts uh, to uh, build bridges uh, across the region uh, and beyond. Uh, I2U2, uh, the partnership that uh, we've conceived of together with our partners to stitch together uh, our own longstanding partnership uh, with Israel, with India, uh, and with the United Arab Emirates in a novel partnership that is reflective, reflect, reflective uh, of our broader efforts to stitch together our longstanding allies and partners into something that uh, helps to serve uh, the, the common good. And of course, our engagement on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't think there is any other country around the world who has worked uh, more concertedly and intensively uh, with Israelis, uh, with Palestinians, uh, to, in the first instance, de-escalate tensions uh, and to preserve the viability of a negotiated two-state solution. Uh, you've seen us do that in uh, particularly uh, acute and even dangerous moments, as in um, mid-2021 in the conflict between Israel and Gaza then. You've seen us do that when tensions are uh, at a heightened state uh, in the West Bank. We're in one of those periods now, and you've seen our officials 
uh, engaging directly on the ground. Secretary Blinken uh, was in the region. Jake Sullivan was in the region. Secretary of Defense Austin uh, was in the region just last week, uh, not to mention uh, many other uh, lower level officials. And our humanitarian assistance, our humanitarian assistance to uh, places like Yemen, to the Palestinian people, a relationship uh, that we made an early point of restoring with the Palestinian Authority and with the Palestinian people. So I think in any way you look at it, uh, America is deeply engaged with the Middle East. Uh, we have, uh, I think, demonstrated results in those efforts to leave uh, a region that is more stable, is more integrated, is more prosperous. Uh, we have a long way to go, but everything we've done uh, over the past couple of years uh, points to uh, what we're trying to achieve. And um, the other question was, is the United States going to even consider nuclear, uh, nu uh, nuclear reactors or nuclear civilian um, reactors to the Saudis in exchange for them recognizing Israel? Let, let me just say that, of course, we support normalization between Israel and its uh, Muslim and Arab, Arab majority neighbors. Uh, and I use that term neighbors loosely because um, we want to broaden the aperture and look at opportunities for uh, countries around the world uh, to normalize their relationship with Israel. Of course, we support normalization between Israel and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is going to have to be a process that uh, those two countries in the first instance are engaged in, but we are going to do uh, what we can as a partner to both to support that process. Sure. It's something we've discussed uh, at uh, great length, the potential for normalization, uh, but as for the content of, of those discussions, we're going to leave that to uh, what we've uh, uh, said behind closed doors. Well, I, I'm, I'm just not going to weigh in on a specific proposal. Said. Thank you. Uh, uh, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't you know, acknowledge how you have engaged with me, and I thank you for that all throughout. I appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the Iran-Saudi uh, deal, and then I'm going to ask any, uh, a question on the Palestinian issue, if I may. Uh, on the Iran-Saudi deal, do you feel that this deal can actually bring tensions down? You know, does it, does it scale back the tension that was building up, you know, and the fear of some sort of a military confrontation with Iran? If the deal is fully implemented, of, of course, it it's, has the potential to de-escalate tensions uh, between these two rather large uh, countries in the Gulf. Of course it does. I think you have to take a look at uh, where we were just uh, a couple years ago and even in some ways uh, just a couple months ago, uh, several years ago, 2019 I believe it was, uh, the attack uh, on the part uh, of the Iranians to, uh, against Saudi Arabia, uh, the potential for uh, attacks that our Saudi partners have endured since then, including as recently as late last year, uh, when the United States worked with our Saudi partners uh, to enhance defensive and deterrence capabilities that ultimately mitigated uh, what was the real, very real possibility of uh, further Iranian aggression against Saudi Arabia. So yes, uh, both in the theoretical sense and in, in a very real and in practical sense, uh, if Iran takes the steps that it has pledged to take, we believe it would. On the, the Palestinian-Israeli issue, you know, and, and my tradition of asking the simple question on this Palestinian issue, today an Israeli court uh, added another 180 days to a Palestinian, Ahmed bin uh, uh, of uh, solitary confinement. He was in, he's been in solitary for 480 days. I believe the internationally sanctioned solitary confinement thing is like 15 days. No. He's been in prison since he was 13 years old. He is 20 today. He has mental issues. He has physical issues. He's isolated. He cannot get visitation and so on. I want your reaction to such a draconian uh, measure. So, Said, I'm not immediately familiar with the details of the case, so I, I can't offer an immediate reaction. But um, this is all part and parcel of, of what we have sought to uh, encourage on the part of both sides. We're at a very dangerous period. Uh, tensions are running high. Israel obviously faces very real risks to its security. We've seen, we've seen vivid demonstrations of that uh, in recent days. Uh, we've encouraged all parties to avoid steps that serve only to exacerbate tensions and um, 
raise the potential for even greater violence. This is a, a period in recent months that has seen an unprecedented number uh, of Palestinians killed. It has seen a large number of Israelis killed. Uh, we have been deeply engaged with Israelis, Palestinians, with our, our partners in the region, the Egyptians and the Jordans, uh, Jordanians um, uh, as, as part of that, to do what we can to de-escalate tensions. As it pertains to this case, uh, if we have a particular comment, we'll, we'll let you know. You know, uh, uh, Nen, I mean, we're not asking Israel to stop imprisoning Palestinians or stop killing them. It would be nice if, if it did. We're not asking them that. We're asking them to abide by international law when they imprison these these boys, I mean, 13 years old and 14 years old, and keeping them uh, under administrative uh, confinement, which nobody else in the world does except for the state of Israel. What is your position on this? Is this part of collective punishment? Do you consider that to be part of a collective punishment? Uh, Said, we've been very clear that collective punishment is is never appropriate. I'm going to hesitate to put a label uh, on on this particular case or this particular practice. Uh, but uh, what we have sought across the board is uh, for our Israeli uh, partners, our Palestinian partners, to avoid the type of steps that only ser serve to exacerbate tensions. Uh, we need the opposite. We need the opposite, especially now, and especially as we're entering a period where. Uh, the three great faiths that uh, in many ways have their roots in this uh, very region uh, will coincide in the coming weeks. So uh, we're, we're deeply engaged uh, and we'll continue uh, to use our voice and, and to, uh, to meet with uh, and to do what we can to see to it that uh, the violence, the cycle of violence comes to an end. Yeah, come on. Um, you know, just to follow up on Andrea's question and try to get you talk a little bit about these conversations with Saudis on normalizing relations with Israel. Um, is it the U.S. assessment that after this Iran-Saudi development, it would be more complicated, at least? Like when you were in discussions with your Saudi partners, um, what, are, what did they say on the prospects of normalization? That's, a, that's very broad. Uh, so first, um, the potential implications of uh, what we saw late last week on uh, on um, Israel, on normalization, on Israel security. This is this is about uh, an agreement that was reached between Iran and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, uh, of course, this is going to be about those two countries. Uh, there is no greater uh, supporter of Israel's security than um, President Biden, uh, as as you've heard him say. Consistently, uh, our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad. We are going to continue to do everything we can, not only to make good on that commitment to Israel's security, but where we can to help expand the bridges uh, that have been built in, in recent years. And I think you look at uh, the engagement that we've undertaken in the region, including when President Biden traveled uh, to the region, to Israel uh, and to the Gulf uh, last summer you see the very tangible results of that. Uh, Saudi airspace uh, that uh, for the first time has uh, been opened up. Again, uh, creating opportunities for Israelis, creating opportunities for people uh, across the region. Uh, you see that in terms of uh, what we've been able to achieve with the help of uh, many of our partners around the world, including the UN, on Yemen. Uh, a more integrated, a more stable region is good for our interests, it is uh, good for Israel, uh, and it is good for people across the region. You literally repeated what you answered to Andrea, but um, did the, um, I'm, I'm basically wondering oh. in what, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we can't expect anything else on your last day, you've done this for the last few years. Um, <laughs> What was the, I mean, what, what did the Saudis say? And then I'm going to repeat myself. What did the Saudis say on their normalization prospects? Or what is your assessment? Whether you think it's going to be more complicated um, or is this going to somehow help at all? This ultimately is a question for Israel and Saudi Arabia. Uh, it is a process that we support. It's a process that we've supported. It's a process we've discussed uh, with both of our partners. Uh, but this is a question for Israel and Saudi Arabia. As for uh, the contents of our discussions 
uh, just as a general rule, you know that we don't read out uh, private diplomatic conversations, but uh, we've remained engaged on this, and we're going to do everything we can to be a supportive partner to both countries. And one last thing, when the Saudis were informing you of the of what was happening, were you um, in turn informing Israelis? Like, were you keeping them in the loop on a daily basis or, you know? Uh, we have close relationships with both countries. Uh, we consult regularly. Uh, as we said before, uh, we were not taken by surprise by the announcement that came out on Friday. Our Saudi partners had uh, kept us up to date. Uh, we engage regularly with our Israeli partners. Secretary Austin was there uh, just last week, and there are many levels uh, at which these conversations occur. Uh, what in touch? I, I'm, I'm not aware that we heard from the, uh, the PRC on this. Courtney. Uh, no, actually. Um, the newly named Chinese Minister of Defense, General uh, Li Shangfu, has been subject to CATSA sanctions since 2018. Um, those include visa restrictions. So what is the administration's plan to potentially ameliorate some of that, the, the challenges that might pose to Secretary Austin being able to meet with his counterpart? Well, Secretary Austin now has, on a couple of occasions, attempted to reach out to uh, his counterpart. Uh, unfortunately, it has been the PRC that uh, has failed to reciprocate. Uh, each time we've made the point that uh, we believe as a responsible country that it is in our interests, it's in the interest of the PRC, it's in the interest of countries around the world uh, for us to maintain open dialogue, multiple, even redundant channels of dialogue as we attempt to perform what is our most uh, important and pressing task, to establish a floor uh, on the relationship and to establish those guardrails to see to it that the competitive aspects of uh, the relationship between us can't veer into conflict. That's why Secretary Blinken has uh, picked up the phone and been in touch with Wang Yi. That's why he met Wang Yi in Munich. That's why we're regularly in touch with the PRC uh, embassy in this country uh, and vice versa from Beijing. Uh, when it comes to Secretary Austin, you saw the readout that uh, the, Secretary, the um, Defense Department put out uh, several weeks ago now, making clear that the PRC refused to uh, engage. Uh, when it comes to this individual, as I understand it, uh, this is a, uh, a largely ceremonial role. It's a different one than uh, the, the role that uh, Secretary Austin has uh, in our system. But uh, we are prepared to engage when it's in our interest to do so. We've made that clear from the very start. Uh, many of you recall uh, the first foreign trip that we took, took us to uh, Japan, took us to South Korea. On the way back, uh, we stopped in Anchorage with Secretary Blinken and Jake Sullivan uh, to engage very early on with our PRC counterparts. Uh, there have been in-person meetings since, there have been phone calls since, there have been video teleconferences uh, ever since, precisely because we do believe what we say about establishing those communications channels uh, as part of an effort to prevent that conflict, that competition from veering into conflict. Uh, Alex. Thank you, um, Well, as one of the beneficiaries of these daily briefings, not only on behalf of colleagues, also on behalf of my audience, so uh, I do subscribe to everything has been said. After 200 plus briefings, I have two more questions left. So, on, uh, all on Iran. So let me throw them sure. over to you so you can uh, maybe uh, take a note on that. One is uh, Russia is spending apparently uh, captured U.S. weapons to Iran. Uh, the reports about that. What is your level of concern on that? And another one, uh, we heard, uh, we have seen videos of uh, President Koshenko's meeting with uh, Iranian uh, president today. Uh, one of the topics that they have been discussing was apparently uh, basically co coordination on how to evade uh, sanctions. Iran uh, wants to share its experience on that. And just want to get your reaction to that. And lastly, uh, there's an increasing tension between Azerbaijan and Iran uh, after Iran last weekend uh, tried to uh, basically uh, flew its, uh, fly its uh, uh, jet, uh, fighter jet uh, on the border and just make a reaction to that as well. Thank you. Uh, so first on uh, Lukashenko's visit to Iran, uh, we see this as in some ways uh, an extension of the deepening relationship between Iran and Russia. Uh, we've been, had no, um, uh, no shortage over the past year. Uh, of sharing our concern uh, of the deepening relationship between uh, Iran and Russia. We've talked about it in terms of the security assistance uh, that, those, uh, that Iran is providing Russia and vice versa. Uh, and we've also made the point that in what Lukashenko has offered uh, to Russia, he has essentially ceded uh, his sovereignty uh, to the Kremlin, to Russia. 
And so now with Lukashenko in Iran, uh, in some ways you can see that as uh, an extension of the deepening partnership between Iran and Russia. But um, it's something we're watching very closely. Uh, these are two birds of a feather, uh, and oftentimes they do um, flock together. Uh, when it comes to the Iranian weapons, um, or excuse me, the, the weapons that uh, have reportedly been captured, I've seen those reports. Uh, I'm not in a position to, uh, to confirm those reports. As you know, uh, we have a robust monitoring plan in place that uh, takes a look at uh, any potential instances of uh, diversion. Uh, we are still uh, where we have uh, been for since the start uh, of this conflict. Uh, we have not seen any credible indications that security assistance that we've provided to uh, our Ukrainian partners have uh, been uh, diverted um, uh, to uh, any other uh, any other actor. But we're watching uh, we're watching this very closely. Uh, and on uh, Azer Azerbaijan uh, and Iran, uh, of course, Iran is a uh, uh, has has long been a um, malign actor um, in the region. It's engaged uh, in malign activities, activities that threaten its neighbors uh, both near and far. Uh, so we watch uh, these types of tensions with concern. Uh, our approach has been to invest in uh, our engagement with uh, Azerbaijan, with Armenia, in the South Caucasus uh, to, as we were saying in a, in a very different in a very different context a moment ago, uh, to create a South Caucasus region that is more stable, uh, that is less uh, prone to conflict, that's less uh, prone to tension. Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Nid. Uh, thanks for the wonderful briefing during your last uh, hour. And uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question uh, on the North Korea. North Korea launched the strategic cruise missiles from uh, Samarin last uh, Sunday. What kind of uh, diplomatic action will the United States currently take in response to North Korea's high intensity provocations? So, Jenny, we're we're aware of the DPRK's submarine launched cruise missile test. Uh, as we've said, uh, in the context of uh, of similar actions, uh, these only serve to heighten tensions uh, in the region. Uh, the DPRK's unannounced cruise missile tests are yet another example mm -hmm. of. Uh, DPRK actions that uh, threaten regional peace and stability. Uh, they also present an unacceptable safety risk to civil aviation and to maritime operations as well. We remain focused uh, on close coordination with our allies and partners to address the multitude of threats that's posed by the DPRK uh, and to advance uh, the shared objective that we put forward in the uh, early months of this administration, namely the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we have had an opportunity in, in recent weeks to engage uh, in depth with our Japanese allies, with our ROK allies. We've had the very happy uh, opportunity to welcome deepened uh, cooperation between those two allies uh, and to make the point that uh, we are going to continue to engage bilaterally but also trilaterally, knowing that uh, the trilateral relationship between the United States, between the ROK, between Japan uh, is critical to our shared efforts uh, because we share, along with the ROK and Japan, a vision of an Indo-Pacific that is free and open. Uh, that's going to be the, the crux of what you hear today from President Biden when he travels to uh, San Diego and he meets with, uh, with another one of our partners in the Indo-Pacific. But uh, Japan and the ROK, the United States, others, uh, we share this vision. The DPRK has consistently posed a challenge uh, to the rules-based order and to the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. As we continue to see these provocations, we're going to work with our partners in the Indo-Pacific. We're going to work with uh, our partners on the other side of the Atlantic uh, to hold the DPRK accountable. Uh, we are going to look at additional ways to do that. Just within recent days, you've heard from us on some of the steps that uh, we have taken to uh, clamp down on sanctions evasion and to pursue targets that support the DPRK's WMD programs. We're also going to continue to make the point and to uh, find ways to reinforce the point that it requires concerted action on the part of, especially on the part of all members of the UN Security Council, especially permanent members of the UN Security Council. 
The DPRK is subject to a number of UN Security Council resolutions owing to the provocations that uh, it has engaged in in recent years. Each and every one of these UN Security Council resolutions were uh, voted on and, and approved by the permanent five members of the Security Council. It is incumbent on all five of those members, including Russia and uh, the PRC, to uphold the commitments that they've made, to uphold the commitments that have uh, been signed into international law, and to recognize that a DPRK that is not held to account, that is able to engage in these type of provocations without concerted uh, accountability from the international community uh, is not in the interest of Russia, it's not in the interest of China, it's not in the interest of any country uh, around the world. And so our task is to continue to work with our partners and allies to hold the DPRK accountable uh, while we are recommitting to the commitment we have to the security and to the defense of our treaty allies in this case. So do you think North Korea will conduct another nuclear test during the USN ROK's joint military exercise, now ongoing joint military exercise? I, I, I would hesitate to offer a uh, prediction, but we've said for a number of months now that the DPRK has finalized all of the steps it would need to take uh, to conduct uh, what would be its seventh nuclear test. Uh, a seventh nuclear test would be uh, a dangerous provocation uh, that would itself uh, constitute a significant threat to peace and security uh, in the region. The entire world would need to respond uh, in a case like that. Um, countries on the Security Council, especially the Permanent Five, uh, we would expect to see, hope to see, I should say, uh, concerted uh, action in response uh, to, st to such a, a destabilizing, destabilizing event. Uh, Leon. Yeah, I, question on on Russia, but before I ask you that question, just to follow up on, on North Korea, is it useful in the context that you mentioned that we all know uh, these escalating tensions to have these uh, most important maneuvers in five years uh, with South Korea, the military maneuvers between Washington and, and, and the United States and South Korea? I mean, how useful is that in the, in the context to, to try and de-escalate the situation there? So, Leanna, a couple points. We've made abundantly clear uh, early on in this administration, uh, and I've repeated it um, too many times to count since, that we harbor no hostile intent towards the DPRK. Uh, we believe that dialogue and diplomacy would be the most would would constitute the most effective means by which uh, to advance in practical ways uh, our policy objective of the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we've made clear that uh, we harbor no hostile intent. We've made clear that we're ready to engage in dialogue and diplomacy. It's the DPRK that has consistently rebuffed that, both by its silence, its failure to respond meaningfully uh, to those overtures, but also uh, by taking the actions that it has taken, uh, including the provocations, uh, the likes of which we're talking about now. Look, the exercises that you're referring to uh, are longstanding, they are routine, they're purely defensive uh, in nature. They support the security of both the United States and in this case, the ROK. And unfortunately, the DPRK has put us in a position to have to reinforce in tangible ways uh, the security commitment that we have. Uh, they have made the security environment in Northeast Asia and the broader uh, Indo-Pacific region all the more dangerous, uh, all the more threatening to uh, our deployed troops, to Americans uh, in the region, and of course to our uh, treaty allies, the Japan and, the, and, and ROK. So it is as a result of that security environment that we are, uh, as a result of that, um, uh, as a result of that, we are continually in a position to have to reaffirm that security commitment to make sure that we're able to uh, make good on that commitment. We would much rather be engaging uh, in dialogue and diplomacy and advancing in real ways the vision of the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, thanks for that. Um, a question on related to, to news uh, uh, today um, on the Black Sea Initiative, uh, the Russians have agreed to, if I understand it correctly, the Russians have agreed to a 60-day extension. 
on the table, I think, uh, unless I'm mistaken, it was 120 days. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, would you accept a 60-day <laughs> extension or, you, uh, or not? Uh, so first, um, let me just say we're, we're at a critical moment in these negotiations. Uh, extending the Black Sea Grant Initiative requires the consent uh, of all the parties, and, and that's something the UN Secretary General is, is working on, including uh, at this very moment. So we're going to defer to the UN Secretary General. We're going to defer to uh, the other parties uh, that are uh, directly involved in the Black Sea uh, Grant Initiative, and I need to be circumspect uh, about the details beyond that because this is a, a critical moment. But uh, our position has always been clear. The world needs this. The world needs the Black Sea Grain Initiative. We believe it should be extended. We believe it should be expanded. Uh, and we believe that because we've seen the implications of a world with the Black Sea Grain Initiative, and we've seen a world without the Black Sea Grain Initiative. After Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine uh, in February of last year, we saw this price uh, in this spike in world food prices. Uh, world food prices spiked nearly 30 uh, percent. Wheat and fertilizer prices spiked nearly 30 percent uh, in the immediate aftermath of, of Russia's full-scale invasion. It wasn't until the Black Sea Grain Initiative was uh, put into place uh, with a great deal of uh, diplomatic support from the United States and, of course, the parties themselves, the UN Secretary General, Turkey, Ukraine, and also uh, with uh, the cooperation of Russia, that these prices started to actually go down. And we have seen millions uh, of metric tons uh, make it to the countries that uh, need food the most. Uh, over four million metric tons of wheat have gone directly to developing countries as a result of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. That may not, that may seem like an abstract number, but uh, it boils down to uh, eight billion loaves of bread to the developing world. Uh, the World Food Program has been able to uh, take advantage of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Sixteen. World Food Program ships have left Ukrainian ports as a result of, of this initiative, taking wheat to places like Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, uh, the places around the world that need it most. Uh, so this is a critical instrument uh, at a critical time. Uh, we uh, know that the world needs this. Uh, we certainly hope and expect uh, to see it extended and expanded. But you don't want to say 60 or 120. You're not we, going to we're, we're going to let the parties themselves uh, speak to it, but before we do. Yeah, Edward. Hi, Ben. Um, I'd like to ask you about a report that the Times had last week on the Biden administration so far refraining from turning over evidence of Russian war crimes to the International Criminal Court. And apparently the main reason this is that they have refrained from doing so is because the Pentagon objects to that action, saying that that might open the way in the future for easier prosecutions of U.S. troops. Um, can you address that and talk about the rationale behind this? And related to that, um, in your 200 plus briefings at the podium, one phrase you've mentioned repeatedly is the rules-based international order, and you say the U.S. defends this order. Can you give us a more precise definition of that and when the U.S. decides to opt into these international institutions and norms and when decides to opt out of those? Uh, so a couple things there, Edward. First, on your, on your first question about the ICC. Um, this goes back to a point I was making in response to a very different region, to a very different question about uh, our inheritance when we came into office in January of 2021. Uh, over the past two years, we have worked very hard uh, to reset and to improve uh, our relationship with the International Criminal Court. Um, in the first instance, we lifted the sanctions that uh, never should have been imposed in the first place. Uh, we returned to engagement with the court and the assembly of states' parties. Uh, we uh, have identified specific areas where we can support ICC investigations uh, and prosecutions, including steps to support the court's work in Darfur, uh, and assistance in locating and apprehending uh, fugitives from international justice, and that includes high-profile fugitives like the LRA's Joseph Coney. Uh, we also uh, offer rewards for information uh, leading to the arrest, the transfer, the conviction of foreign nationals accused of committing war crimes uh, and crimes against humanity or, or genocide before uh, the ICC. Uh, so we do provide uh, many forms of support. Uh, what we don't do, however, is uh, detail in the specific 
uh, in specific forms, uh, what that support looks like or what we may be pro providing directly uh, to the ICC. And we don't do that for a very simple reason. Uh, this is uh, an international court uh, that is pursuing accountability. It's pursuing justice. Uh, we don't want to do anything or to say anything uh, that could jeopardize the sanctity uh, of an investigation, that could set back the pursuit uh, of that justice. Uh, I'd make uh, one other point on this, uh, Edward, that um, your paper reported uh, on uh, one form of support that we're allegedly uh, not providing. Uh, but you've heard us over the course of the past year uh, speak to the efforts we are resorting to around the world to empower uh, a number of organizations to collect, to preserve, to analyze, uh, to um, disseminate precisely the kinds of information uh, that would be court admissible. Uh, that uh, international tribunals, whether it's the ICC, whether it's the UN's Commission of Inquiry, uh, whether it's the OSCE's uh, Moscow mechanism, uh, could in fact use to uh, pursue and to uh, advance cases uh, that could culminate in accountability and justice for those who are responsible for some of the most heinous war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, that we've seen in Ukraine. Uh, the virtue of this type of support is uh, we are empowering organizations uh, to collect open source information, uh, information that is um, available to everyone, but um, that in turn these organizations package in such a way uh, that they are comprehensive, they are done in a rigorous way, uh, and uh, they're court admissible. So beyond uh, the categories of support that I just listed, um, we are enabling uh, a number of actors around the world to do what they can to support the ICC, uh, to support other venues, including uh, courts of uh, national jurisdiction uh, in places like Ukraine and other countries around the world uh, that have universal jurisdiction where uh, war criminals or, or accused war criminals, I should say, uh, could be tried. Um, on, the, on the second part of your question, Ed, this is, this is not uh, a rules-based order that uh, the United States created. It is not uh, created alone. It is not a, a rules-based order uh, that um, uh, is a product of the West. This is a rules-based order. When we talk about that rules-based order, that emanated from the ashes of the Second World War. Uh, that was uh, created in the aftermath of, of that to see to it, at least in every uh, reasonable way, uh, that uh, the Second w World War wouldn't one day uh, give rise to a third. Uh, it is enshrined in so much of what the United States is committed to and where you see us engaging uh, every single day. The UN system, the UN Charter, uh, international law, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, whether it's the Ukraine context, whether it is uh, any other context, just about every single day you hear us speaking to the importance of these elements, you seeing us taking actions around the world uh, to uh, preserve, to promote, to defend uh, these elements, and where countries around the world are uh, flouting uh, the rules-based order, uh, you see the United States oftentimes um, leading the charge for accountability. That takes us back to uh, your first question. Uh, yeah. As I understand it, the answer you just gave now in response to Ed's first question is that nothing has changed since you answered the question on Thursday. That right? is correct. Okay. So, so, but then the second thing is, is that you brought this up and talking about the LRA and how you cooperate mm -hmm. with it. But in that case, with the Obama administration, they actually did provide specific intel to the to, to the ICC. But not and, and 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 the Pentagon or whoever, if they had an issue with it, it didn't seem to stop it. So what, what, what's the difference here? Because the LRA, LRA didn't, don't have nukes? No, so Matt, I'm not saying that there is a difference because we are just not speaking to the forms of support we provide to the ICC. Um, well, it, it, okay, it, it, the administration that you previously served in did speak to but the, the administration did not speak specifically uh, to forms of support that we no, provided to the ICC. We gave them a satellite photo. And, 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 and we, are, we, are, we, are taking, we are taking precisely the same approach uh, in this administration in this case, yes. So you're just not telling the Pentagon. You're, you're doing it over their objections and not telling them. 
No, 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 Matt. I'm, I'm oh. speaking about what, what we talk about publicly. In the Obama-Biden administration, we didn't detail specifically the type of support and assistance that we provided to the ICC. Well, in, in, you're not going to do it at all because... No, I, I just... The story, uh, I mean... And I'm... Yes. And you gave the exact same answer yep. to. You didn't say that it was wrong. In fact, I'm you just, suggested uh, that it was correct. And I, now we're... I didn't, I didn't comment on the veracity of the report. I'm not speaking to the veracity of the report. Uh, what I'm saying is a general matter, whether it was in the last administration, the administration before that, uh, we don't speak in specific terms to the type of support well, that we do or do not provide to the ICC. That, I, I stand corrected there, yes. Yes, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Jackson Richmond with the Epic Times. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, based on reports from the field, the conflict in Ukraine shows no signs of ending anytime soon. Meanwhile, public support for continued U.S. assistance for Kyiv appears to be waning. In light of these realities, is the State Department prepared to reconsider its policy of backing Ukraine, quote unquote, for as long as it takes? And then my second question is, two big name banks in the U.S., Silicon Valley Bank and Signature, have been shut down by the feds. This has ramifications not just in the U.S., but also abroad. How do these shutdowns reflect the United States on the global stage? Uh, so uh, a couple things. First, uh, let me just take the, the second question first. I'm going to let my colleagues at uh, the Treasury Department, the FDIC, uh, and, uh, and other colleagues uh, handle these questions. I don't want to say anything from here uh, that could uh, royal uh, financial markets, certainly not on my last day. Um, <laughs> uh, your first question. Um, <laughs> uh, your first question uh, about standing with Ukraine. Uh, we are committed to standing with Ukraine for as long as it takes. We are um, committed to our Ukrainian partners, uh, but ultimately what we are committed to is, to go back to Edward's question, the rules-based order. Uh, what is at play when it comes to Russian aggression against Ukraine is, yes, about Ukraine in the first instance. Russia attempting to deny uh, Ukraine um, the right to exist. Uh, to dictate Ukraine's foreign policy, the choices uh, that should be uh, and must only be up only to Ukrainians. Uh, but in some ways, this is much larger um, than Ukraine or any single country. Uh, it is about the basic notions that are at the heart of the UN Charter, at the heart of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, at the heart of international law. And they basically boil down to uh, whether you call it the rules-based order or the rules of the road, uh, but very simple premises. Uh, big countries can't bully small countries. Might doesn't make right. Uh, countries have a sovereign right to uh, determine their own uh, future, their own partnerships, their own alliances, uh, their own aspirations. If Russia is permitted to challenge that, in an unchecked way in Ukraine, uh, countries around the world may well take license uh, to challenge that uh, in other regions. When the rules-based international order comes under threat anywhere, uh, we believe it comes under threat everywhere. And so it's important for uh, the United States to be resolute along with the dozens of countries around the world uh, who have uh, not only stood with Ukraine, but uh, endorsed uh, the UN system, the UN Charter, international law, uh, the UN Declaration of, uh, of Human Rights. Uh, more than 140 countries around the world have done that three times now. Uh, and that is because uh, this is not a Western construct. It is not an American construct. Uh, this is uh, an order that countries around the world believe in. It is an order that countries around the world uh, have witnessed uh, undergird unprecedented levels of stability, of security, uh, of prosperity uh, since over the 80 years or so since the end of the Second World why War. Why not send Ukraine uh, fighter jets and um, enact maximum sanctions against Russia, similar to the U.S. maximum pressure campaign on Iran? Uh, well, I think you look at the sanctions that we've enacted against Russia, and what you see is a comprehensive sanctions regime uh, that is uh, that has, in the first instance, crippled uh, the Russian economy. Uh, it has uh, caused the Kremlin to have to resort to extraordinary measures uh, to prop up uh, Moscow's economy, to prop up the currency, to prop up financial markets uh, in a way that is just not sustainable over the longer term. And you look at uh, the broader set of measures, the export controls that we've put in place that have systematically deprived Russia uh, of the ability to import 
the raw materials that it will need over the longer term to project aggression against Ukraine or uh, any other country for that matter. And so however you look at it, whatever economic, financial uh, metric you look at, uh, you see that uh, the sanctions the, Internet, the United States and our uh, dozens of partners around the world have implemented um, have had uh, tremendous effect. On the question of the F-16, uh, what we have done is to provide our Ukrainian partners with what they need for uh, the battle they are facing at the moment and uh, the direction in which that uh, battle is evolving. And you don't have to take our word for the effectiveness of that approach. Uh, you can look at the determination, the resilience, the grit of our Ukrainian partners, uh, but also the success that that has translated to and that in some ways has been enabled by the massive amounts of security assistance that the United States and some 50 countries uh, around the world uh, have provided. These are decisions that we make on a dynamic basis, looking at um, precisely what the needs are in conversation with our Ukrainian partners, in conversation uh, with our partners in Europe, uh, in NATO, and around the world as well. Yes. Uh, Ned, over the weekend, Senate Com Commander General Kurila was in Syria and he visited two camps, two ISIS detainee camps. He said there is no military solution uh, to the ISIS detainee population. There are thousands of detainees, and inclu including new, new generations are being raised in these camps. Uh, what is the department doing in order to empty these camps? We, we are focused with countries around the world on what will be the sustainable uh, solution, and that's repatriation. Uh, we have applauded a number of countries, including in recent days, who have been able to repatriate their citizens from Al Hol, from other uh, detainee camps. We believe that's the only uh, means by which to address this challenge. Uh, our Bureau of Counterterrorism has uh, been going around the world, as have our regional bureaus, to uh, make specific general asks of countries as well. Uh, to do everything we can to lessen the detainee population uh, and to do what we can to responsibly close uh, these detention facilities. Most of, most of countries try to, uh, to appear indifferent to their citizens in those camps. Isn't there a concern that these people are further radicalized in those camps and converse the U.S. mission in, in Syria into a creep mission? Into a what mission, I'm sorry? A mission creep. like A, a mission creep. Well, uh, there are a number of reasons why we, we want to sustainably uh, lessen the population at these camps. Some of it has to do with humanitarian conditions. Some of it has to do uh, with the ability for um, individuals to uh, be radicalized uh, in, in a place like this. Uh, but it just speaks to the urgent need that we see for countries around the world uh, to take uh, decisive and bold steps uh, to repatriate their citizens. Uh, we have attempted uh, to lead by example. There are a number of countries around the world uh, who have also uh, sought to lead by example, and we're enc encouraging more of that. Camilla. Um, thank you, Ned. Um, congratulations on your last Thank you. Um, I, for one, appreciated your gratitude for this press call. Um, I believe it was the previous secretary who described us as hyenas. So I'm not going to ask you what <laughs> group of animals this I, I State Department that. may compare yeah, us to, yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, not not lap dogs, I will tell you that. Uh, uh, thought I'd be remiss not to ask you one of your favorite topics on Afghanistan. Um, uh, Representative Michael McCall uh, told CBS on Sunday that he's giving the secretary until March 23rd to hand over what he describes as outstanding documentation regarding this, the administration's withdrawal from Afghanistan. That includes a dissent cable, Ambassador Dan Smith's after action report and the uh, Kabul Embassy Emergency Action Plan. Um, I was just wondering if you had a response to what he said. Sure, um, look, we are committed to working with all congressional uh, committees with jurisdiction to appropriately accommodate their need for information uh, to help them conduct uh, their uh, oversight for legislative purposes. Uh, we had a very productive, very constructive relationship with the 117th Congress. Uh, we hope and expect to have uh, a very similar relationship with this Congress. Uh, we have provided more than 150 briefings uh, to bipartisan members and staff on Afghanistan policy since the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. 
Uh, additionally, uh, senior officials from this department have appeared in public hearings and answered questions on Afghanistan. Uh, and the department has responded to numerous requests for information from members uh, and their staffs related to Afghanistan policy. Uh, as Chairman McCall said, I believe, on, on your network yesterday, uh, he and the secretary had a, a very constructive discussion when the chairman was uh, here at the department earlier this year. Uh, it was then that the secretary uh, reaffirmed directly to Chairman McCall his commitment to cooperate with the committee's work, and we've since provided hundreds of pages of documents responsive to the chairman's request on Afghanistan. Uh, we're working as expeditiously as possible to accommodate uh, what was uh, just about by, by any measure an extensive and detailed request, uh, and our provision of, of information and documents to the committee will continue uh, as we collect and process uh, additional responsive records. Yeah, Jenny. Thanks for having me to echo everyone else's thanks for, for all your work. Um, there are reports that three American women went missing in Nuevo León, Mexico, several weeks ago. Does the State Department have any information on this? I, I've seen those reports, but uh, we're not in a position to confirm them. And in fact, uh, we are uh, not aware that these reports are, are accurate. We are aware. Uh, of three Mexican nationals who uh, resided in Texas uh, who have been uh, reported missing, however. Uh, uh, higher travel warning against travel to Mexico? Our travel warnings to Mexico, as they are to countries around the world, are dynamic. They are based on the conditions on the ground. When it comes to Mexico, uh, our travel warnings are especially dynamic in that they are um, uh, they are organized by state, and so the travel guidance that we provide to American citizens is tailored uh, to uh, each individual uh, Mexican state and the security situation that we assess uh, on the ground at any given time. Are you considering upgrading? We are always looking at information uh, to determine whether uh, it is necessary to move our travel warnings in, in one direction or another. In These. Uh, again, our, I, mean just the, I mean, just because of the recent kidnappings. The, our, our travel warnings for Mexico are, again, are uh, organized by state. And so we're looking at conditions state by state to determine uh, if an upgrade, if a downgrade is necessary. That is a uh, process that happens every single day uh, between our embassies, between, in this case, uh, our Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, our Bureau of Consular Affairs. Uh, as soon as we have made the decision that uh, a change in our travel advisory is warranted. It will be uh, updated uh, online and will alert the American citizen community. Yeah, just in response to your, yeah. good. Mm -hmm. So you think that, that, that this report, the report that there are th another three American women may be confused with or may be inaccurate because they're actually Mexican citizens? I, I, I couldn't say. I, they have had, uh, do you know if the three Mexicans who, Mexican women who you believe have been reported missing had U.S. residency or? I, I, Matt, I, I couldn't say and I wouldn't want to speak to the details, but um, we are aware of reports of three missing uh, Mexican citizens who uh, previously resided in, uh, in Nuevo, Le yeah. Nuevo Leon. Where are the, so they resided, they lived in Texas? That's right. Yes? Correct, yes. We got a response that you were aware of three U.S. citizen reports of three U.S. citizens missing in Mexico. Uh, we'll we'll check on that, but okay. we'll we'll get back to you if there's anything else to, to offer. Nick, uh, I obviously haven't been here always, but uh, we've always been watching. So thank you for bringing back the daily briefing. Questions about AUKUS. I know that you won't get ahead of the president, but a few questions I think you can answer. Uh, first one: Xi Jinping last week accused the U.S. of containing trying to contain China. How is uh, sending American submarines and helping Australia build uh, Virginia-class submarines not an example of the U.S. containing China? Uh, so first, Nick, I, I don't want to get ahead of the president, and he'll be speaking to this later today, I believe in the 5 o'clock hour Eastern time. Uh, so I will um, uh, refer you to his remarks on, on AUKUS specifically. On the broader question, however, and this is something we, we talked about last week, uh, our goal is not to contain China. Uh, it is um, not the case that uh, we or any other country could, even if we wanted to. And again, uh, that is not our goal. Our goal is not to hold China back. Uh, our goal is to uphold uh, the rules-based order that applies equally in the Indo-Pacific as it does in Europe and places in between. Um, our concern is that 
uh, contrary to our goal of preserving, defending, promoting uh, the rules-based order, uh, we have seen the PRC attempt to challenge it, uh, to challenge it in a, in a number of uh, important and in some ways destabilizing and dangerous ways. Uh, we share the vision, the vision we share uh, with our partners in the Indo-Pacific, and it's certainly the vision we share with our uh, Australian allies in this case, is, is one of uh, a region that is free and, and, and open. Uh, that is what our work together in the Indo-Pacific uh, is about. Every time we see the PRC attempt to uh, challenge the rules-based international order, uh, attempt to challenge the status quo uh, in various places, that is uh, of concern to us. It's a, of concern to countries around the world. I've been trying to stay broad, but I do have to ask one question about AUKUS. There's been bipartisan questions, as you know, about the submarine industrial base, the U.S.'s ability to actually build their own submarines, uh, let alone lend them or, or rotate them or, or sell them to Australia. Um, and, and some people who are in favor of AUKUS are, are worried about this. Is it the administration's belief that Australia's first nuclear-powered submarine in some ways provides more deterrence to China than the U.S.'s 22nd Virginia-powered submarine? And is that part of the effort behind AUKUS, the overall complication of China's efforts when it looks at the military across the Pacific? Our uh, colleagues uh, from uh, the Defense Department offered some, some words on this uh, last week. I, I suspect you'll hear more about this later today. But uh, let me just make the, the broader point that um, this is about a vision of the Indo-Pacific that is free and open. It is a vision that we share with our uh, Australian partners in this case, but it's a, it's a vision that we share with our other allies and partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific. AUKUS itself is also a reflection of what we've sought to do around the world, not only to revitalize the alliances and the partnerships uh, that were in many cases deeply frayed or atrophied uh, when we assumed office in January of 2021, but to take those longstanding partnerships and alliances and to stitch them together, uh, to stitch them together within theaters, in some cases to stitch them together across the globe, bringing our Australian allies together with our British allies in this case. Uh, we're doing that because uh, we share, again, these uh, common interests, common values in the Indo-Pacific. It's a vision of the Indo-Pacific that uh, is free and open, and that in too many places is coming under challenge. And in terms of, sorry, and just last one, and coming under challenge, has the U.S. done enough not only to deter China with militarily, but also with investments and political uh, participation, especially in the Pacific Islands. You know, some people still criticize you for not having enough uh, of an answer, for example, Chinese investment, Chinese 5G, uh, and only threatening people uh, when they consider partnering with China. Uh, Nick, I, look, I can't speak to uh, the, the approach of previous administrations. I wouldn't want to speak to the approach of previous administrations, I would say. Uh, but you've heard consistently uh, from us, this is not about forcing countries to choose between the United States and China, the United States and any other country. This is about uh, providing countries around the world with choices, affirmative choices, desirable choices, uh, choices that would allow uh, the United States and uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific, in this case, uh, to pursue our collective interests. We talked about uh, the funding and the infrastructure element a bit uh, during the budget rollout uh, late last week. But uh, the point I made then is that uh, we are not seeking to match the PRC dollar for dollar uh, in the amount that they uh, provide to, let's call them infrastructure, um, projects uh, around the world. Uh, in some ways, we uh, couldn't do that, given that they have a state-run economy and a command-style economy that uh, we don't, obviously. Uh, but what we bring to, gear, to bear is a whole-of-society approach an approach that not only harnesses what the federal government does, and obviously the budget request the president sent forward on Thursday to Congress uh, has a tremendous amount of resources that would allow us to uh, compete and uh, ultimately to outcompete with the PRC and the Indo-Pacific, but uh, we have an American private sector. We have ingenuity within the American uh, people. We have a system of alliances and partnerships uh, that is unmatched by any other country. And when you bring all of those to bear, we believe that the United States, and acting together with our allies and partners, present that affirmative, desirable choice that so many countries around the world uh, want and seek. One tangible illustration of this uh, is the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. 
Again, uh, this is uh, not about matching the PRC, PRC spending dollar for dollar uh, from the federal budget, uh, but this is uh, bringing to bear uh, funding from uh, our uh, respective governments, the, the governments with whom we partner on PGII, but also the private sector to mobilize over the course of five years hundreds of billions of dollars for high quality, transparent, eco-friendly uh, infrastructure projects, the likes of which no other country could provide, uh, and the likes of which would be a difficult proposition to turn down um, for any country uh, in that region or, or elsewhere. I'll take a final question or so. Uh, Abby, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, Abby, go ahead and I'll come back to you. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, and I just want to echo, obviously, the thanks to my colleagues um, for bringing back the briefing. And uh, I wanted to ask follow up on Mexico. There's been reports that there's more than 550 Americans missing um, in Mexico. Can you speak to that report or offer an alternative number? If I, I can't. I can't speak to that uh, that figure specifically, and I understand this is a figure that was aggregated over the course of, of many years now, and so I, I, I can't speak to that figure uh, specifically. But um, we, uh, whenever we receive a report of an of a missing American citizen, uh, our team on the ground, the team back here, uh, springs into action to support the family, to support the loved ones in in every uh, way we can. Uh, the other complication when it comes to to missing. Uh, American citizens, and this is not unique to Mexico, this happens around the world, oftentimes our embassy will receive uh, a report of a missing American uh, only for the family to be reunited with that American hours or in some cases uh, slightly, uh, slightly later, and, and without that follow up to the US Embassy. So uh, there are many cases that, while they may look unresolved on our books, uh, cases that have been long resolved, where families and loved ones have been uh, reunited. But I'm just not able to comment on that figure specifically. Yes, in the back. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, best wishes for Thanks. your next uh, professional move. Um, we heard recently voices uh, um, out of Israel expressing concern about uh, violence leading to civil war in that country. And uh, we've also heard from the former Israeli Prime Minister a call for civil disobedience if the current status of the Israeli Supreme Court were to be changed. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you if uh, you have, or to what extent you are concerned, the US is concerned about, its, about the future of it, its interests in the Middle East in light of what's currently going on in Israel. Uh, we are always going to have an abiding interest in the Middle East. We are always going to have uh, an ironclad partnership with Israel because uh, it is a relationship, the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, is one that uh, since its uh, first moments in 1948 has been predicated on, yes, those shared values, but uh, also uh, shared interests as well. Um, our goal in, in uh, our engagement with our Israeli partners has been, and with our Palestinian uh, partners for that matter, has been to encourage de-escalation. Um, this is a volatile moment for uh, many reasons on, uh, in, in different realms. When it comes to tensions between Israelis and Palestinians, we're uh, engaged on that. When it comes to the vibrant and dynamic debate that is taking place within Israel. Uh, we are speaking to our Israeli uh, partners as a fellow democracy. We are offering uh, the perspective that uh, we have as uh, a fellow democracy. Um, again, offering the idea uh, both publicly and privately that from our vantage point, uh, building consensus uh, for fundamental changes is the most uh, effective way to see to it that any change is durable, any change is uh, sustainable. There is a dialogue going on now between the prime minister, between the president, between uh, citizens of Israel uh, at every level. This is a, a dialogue for uh, them to have, but uh, we have offered our, our perspective, again, as a fellow democracy. And to the extent that uh, the U.S. describes Israel as a democracy, as you've just uh, uh, said, uh, there are now uh, Israelis who are saying that is not so until the Palestinians are free of Israeli occupation. I just wanted to see uh, to what extent you agree with that parameter for describing, for continuing to describe Israel as a democracy. We have a vision, as do so many countries around the world, as do Israelis and Palestinians, for a negotiated two-state solution. Uh, the end goal of which would be 
uh, a, a, a Jewish uh, democracy uh, living side by side next to a, a Palestinian state uh, with uh, security and stability afforded to both. Uh, our goal at the moment is um, not to um, set the parties on an immediate path to discussions uh, towards that negotiated two-state solution, but um, initially at least to preserve the viability uh, for a two-state solution. Our concern uh, is that both parties, Israelis and Palestinians, not take steps uh, that put that viability of a negotiated two-state solution further out of reach. Uh, it's uh, important for the near term, but it's also uh, quite important for uh, the longer term as we uh, hope to do everything we can to advance uh, the shared vision many of us have uh, for that negotiated two-state solution. Andrew? Can I follow up? Sure. It's one thing to say that there should be de-escalation on both sides, but we're at a, Israel is at a pivotal point according to President Herzog, leaders of, former leaders of Mossad and Shin Bet, as well as you know, 37 elite pilots who you know, refused to train last Wednesday, and half a million people in Tel Aviv on you know, protesting. So civilian society is torn apart. Does it still remain a democracy if these proposed changes go through as, as proposed and there's no compromise? It, does the, doesn't the U.S. have a view about Israel as a democracy based on our economic, military, and other commitments to it that are based on it being a democracy. What you are seeing and what you've just pointed to, we think is a reflection of the vibrancy of Israel's democracy. Uh, this is a conversation that is taking place across Israel. Uh, as it so often is in democratic systems around the world, it can be messy, it can be ugly, um, but ultimately this is a conversation between Israelis to determine uh, the types of steps that they think is appropriate or not. Our perspective on this is not to weigh in on specific uh, reform proposals, but we have, we have perspective gained over the course of our 250-year history uh, on how to achieve a degree of durability, how to achieve a degree of sustainability uh, when it comes to any proposals, reforms that have put forward that have been put forward. That's the kind of guidance, that's what we're offering to uh, our Israeli partners. That's what you heard the President speak to and the Secretary as well. There's no step that they could take that would, look, that would get us to rethink some fundamental uh, aspects of the relationship. Uh, Andrea, it's hard to envision uh, a day when we do not share interests and we do not share values uh, with our Israeli partners. Uh, we are fellow democracies, we have been fellow democracies uh, since 1948, uh, and we are uh, fully confident that uh, that is not going to change as this debate plays out uh, in Israel. I'll take a final right, question. Uh, thank you, Ned. Uh, I personally want to thank you as well, uh, especially for the <coughs> respect you have given to the foreign journalist, and I have personally enjoyed your metaphors a lot. In every press briefing, you have some metaphor. Mm -hmm. And today the metaphor was two feathers from the same bird, I think. That was the metaphor. Yes. Um, and I think you have done a great job in telling the American or President Biden's story uh, in the foreign relations. So I want to start just uh, one question about the uh, UK uh, ambassador. Craig Murray just uh, uh, tweeted a couple of days ago that uh, President Biden uh, uh, has basically removed the former prime minister of uh, Pakistan, Imran Khan from power and since he has been removed 80 cases has been registered against him which includes terrorism murder sedition and all these things uh, and i've heard you say this several times on this uh, standing here that uh, president biden stands with countries not individuals so anything about that like what is the what is the stand on pakistan since 11 months i'm very confused how uh, What's the position of Biden's administrations on Pakistan? Well, you just said yourself. I, I think we've been clear and consistent uh, on this. 
we support the peaceful upholding of democratic, constitutional, and legal principles uh, around the world. And of course, that includes in Pakistan. Uh, regarding the specifics of domestic politics between parties, uh, we don't take a position. We don't favor one political candidate. We don't favor one party over another. Uh, what we do favor is uh, a constitutional system, is a legal framework. Uh, and all parties, including in Pakistan, uh, abiding uh, by that constitutional framework. Okay, then how come President Modi, about whom uh, New York Times has written two editorials in the last one month about the way he's treating journalists, and last time when I asked you about uh, the BBC documentary, you had not watched that documentary. Have you read the New York Times editorials, how journalists and Muslims are being treated in India under his rule? Because I understand India is the partner. But should you defend President Modi to this extent? We, we defend our shared values. We defend our human rights uh, around the world. Uh, we make the same po points when it comes to uh, civil society, human rights uh, in Pakistan, as we do uh, in India, as we do in other countries uh, around the world. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Igor Nemush, the Novosti. So, on reference that Xi Jinping is going to talk to Vladimir Zelensky after his uh, Moscow visit in attempt to become more engaged in negotiating and uh, conflict resolving. So, does the U.S. believe that these efforts can lead to any meaningful and positive outcomes? So, what are your expectations? Well, uh, we would certainly uh, like to see and hope to see an engagement between President Xi and President Zelensky. Uh, it's our understanding from our Ukrainian partners that uh, there is not an engagement uh, yet on the books, but uh, we'll see what uh, develops and what the parties say. There are countries uh, around the world that have uh, a relationship with Russia that we do not have. Uh, China is... Uh, at the top of that list in terms of the relationship it has uh, with Russia and the leverage uh, that it has with Russia. Uh, we would like to see countries around the world use those relationships and use that leverage uh, to help encourage uh, the Russians to end this brutal war of aggression, to put an end uh, the, to the violence and the killing uh, that has claimed far too many Ukrainian and far too many uh, Russian lives uh, as well. Unfortunately, uh, we've yet to see the PRC do that. Uh, even as uh, the PRC professes uh, to uh, have this uh, veneer of neutrality, uh, the PRC has supported Russia's aggression in important ways. Uh, economic support, political support, diplomatic support, rhetorical support uh, in terms of uh, parroting and echoing uh, the dangerous messaging and lies that we've heard from, uh, from Moscow. Uh, so we would certainly like to see uh, the PRC use the leverage that it does have to bring about uh, an end to this invasion. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, we'll wait and see if there's an engagement between President Xi and President uh, Zelensky. Yes, final question. Thank you. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Vershinin said today that the sanctions relief on, on Russian uh, agricultural products and fertilizers doesn't work. Do you have any comments here? And does the U.S. stand ready to consider legitimate Russian concerns here? Uh, we find it difficult to um, believe that when we know, and the rest of the world knows, uh, that Russia's uh, exports of food and fertilizer are back up to pre-war levels. Uh, this uh, has been the case for some time now. Uh, but when we hear the Russians saying that um, they are being held back um, from exporting grain, from exporting fertilizer. It's just not true. Uh, we've made very clear in the imposition of sanctions uh, on Russia for this brutal aggression that we've exempted food, we've exempted fertilizer, we have gone to extraordinary lengths to communicate to the private sector, to communicate uh, to governments around the world uh, that all of our sanctions have carve-outs. All of our sanctions have carve-outs for food, fertilizer, uh, other important humanitarian carve-outs, as they do in our sanctions regimes around the world. So it's just not true. We've heard a number of excuses from Russia uh, in recent days and weeks as to why the Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, might not be extended. Uh, we believe it boils down to the fact that the world needs this Black Sea Grain Initiative. The world needs uh, grain from Ukraine, wheat from Ukraine. The world needs to be able to feed itself uh, and to take advantage uh, of this initiative that uh, since its launch in August of last year 
has decreased food prices, uh, has led to an influx of wheat and other foodstuffs on uh, the global marketplace, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, has certainly saved lives. Last one. Okay. Last week. Last. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.